Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? So what, I, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to just tell you a story in barest outline, and then I'm going to fill in some of the details if I can, if I have time. <laughs> so um, here's the story. <clears throat> in 1929, Wittgenstein was invited by the Aristotelian Society to give a talk in their annual series of talks. You can hear me, okay? Yeah, okay. Um, and so, and now the, the procedure in the Aristotelian Society is that um, a contributor, someone in the series, is supposed to submit a finished paper several months before the talk. And the paper's then published, so it's available to anybody who wants to come to the talk. So people can come to the talk armed with questions or objections and things like that. That's the way it works. Okay, so that's, there were supposed to be good discussions afterwards. So Wittgenstein wrote a paper and submitted it, and it was published by the Society. Everything went in the normal way. Um, the paper's called Some Remarks on Logical Form, and it is published. Um, this is... Um, um, but... When he was working through what he actually did in the paper, and I don't have to tell you what it is, it's, it's about the Tractatus, 
Um, um, he eventually, the Tractatus just as it were, collapsed before his eyes. He saw that he had been all wrong in the Tractatus. And so when he got to the um, session of the Aristotelian Society, he did not read that paper. He talked about something else, and I'm not sure what it is, but you can find out. But not that, something else. Um, I should, I didn't get to my slides yet, and that's, wait a minute, I have to, Okay. Um, is that the first one? Yeah. So it gets all that. Okay. So this is the first paragraph of the paper that he wrote and published, but did not talk about to the Aristotelian Society. Okay. And um, and um, what he says in there, um, I don't. He doesn't use the term, but anyway, he's in that in the first paragraph. He already tells you that there is a need for something. Um, which he calls atomic propositions. This is um, the last stage you can get to an analysis before you lose the form of a proposition altogether, right? Um, um, a few years later, um, he had this to say about himself in the Tractatus. Um, he found the Tractatus arrogant, um, <laughs> He found that um, he was mistaken to think that there had to be, he could say what there had to be in the structure of thought and then leave it as a problem to be discovered later what these things were. Okay, so here we are in about 1929 and um, uh, he's abandoned the Tractatus. Okay, by 1931, sometime maybe the end of 1931, the rough outlines of the kind of view that you find in the philosophical investigations were already present in his writings. Um, so we can ask the question what happened in 1929 to 1931. Now, um, um, fortunately, we know what happened. We know, that is, we don't know everything that happened, but we have a good deal of information about what happened in those years because um, Moritz Schlick, Wittgenstein had re was returned to Vienna from his adventures in Lower Austria. Um, and um, Moritz Schlick found a young man, Friedrich Weismann, and assigned Weismann the task of following Wittgenstein everywhere he went as much as possible. Okay. Um, and recording everything that Wittgenstein said as much as possible also. Um, and so Weismann and Wittgenstein became friends, or sort of friends, and they, there was a series of conversations they had where Weismann took good notes. We have that. Um, and so we sort of know what went on in that period, or we know something about what went on. Um, one thing we know is that in that period, Wittgenstein had two main interests. One was um, in trying to find out what he should think, what he should say, um, um, if the, which would be right, the right way of approaching what he approached in, a, in the wrong way in the Tractatus. Okay, so the Tractatus view was going to be replaced by something else, the question, what? Okay. Um, and the other thing is that Wittgenstein was interested in developments in philosophy of mathematics or foundations of mathematics. Um, I mean, he always was interested in that since he started philosophy, okay. Um, now, um, one of the main things that was going on in foundations of mathematics at that time was that, correct me if I'm wrong about this, was that um, mathematicians were sort of absorbing the new ideas about how to do foundations of mathematics developed by David Hilbert, um, who, um, was professor of mathematics at Göttingen starting in 1895, so this period from 1895 up till the 1930s or something. This was, was a period of some change and some changes in mathematics and the way mathematics was done. Um, one thing is that, this is one thing you, you learn from reading Frege, is that Hilbert attracted 
I, I should say, I think, if I understand Hilbert correctly, most of the changes he was suggesting in how to do mathematics are just normal mathematics nowadays. They're just sort of mainline stuff, but apparently not then. Okay. Um, and um, um, Hilbert attracted, I better hurry up with the story, but Hilbert attracted, among other things, certain second raters. Well, who doesn't? Okay. Now, um, um, among the second raters was a man named Johannes Tome, who, as it happens, was, um, um, roughly speaking, he was the dean of Frege's faculty at Jena. Gottlob, that's Gottlob Frege. Gottlob Frege is, I think, the most important philosopher in the second half of the 19th century and first half of the 20th, let's say, except for possibly Wittgenstein. Okay. Um, um, and, and maybe because of that, um, Tome had, um, uh, uh, it seems, an unbounded capacity to get up Frege's nose. Okay. <laughs> so, so Frege um, th wrote a second volume of his book, Grundgesetze uh, der Arithmetik, and um, um, a large, a pretty large part of that volume is um, um, dedicated to criticizing Tome and another man named Heine, who were formalist arithmeticians. Okay. I'm just telling you this story. Okay, let me just tell you the story a little further. Okay. So, so, because of Wittgenstein's interest in mathematics, he was led to read Frege. I mean, he knew Frege already, that's true, but the second volume of this Grundgesetze der Arithmetik. And what I'm going to try to show is um, how that led him to the idea of a language game. Okay, so that's the rough story. Now, um, let's see what's on the next slide. This will be a surprise for all of us. Um, yes, okay, so here is Frege quoting Tome from um, um, about formal, formal arithmetic. So formal arithmetic is supposed to be a game um, played with empty signs, except in so far as those signs um, gain content by the rules of the game, okay? Just by the formal relations between these signs themselves. That is, the rules are, here's these signs, and you compute, compute in quotes with them, so, so right, there's the rules. You go from these signs to these signs, you make certain transitions. From this, um, so enough content is supposed to arise, this is the implication here, so that um, the whole thing can be, can qualify as um, arithmetic, okay. Um, and Frege's idea was, I don't know, how am I doing for time? Ten minutes or something? Okay. Frege's idea was that this is impossible. Now I should say, since I don't have very much time, I'm going to engage in a form of mathematics now which is called hand-waving. Okay, so, um, um, okay, so let's ask this question. I, I'm gonna, I'll put the next slide up there, but um, this is from Frege's Begriffsschrift, right? Um, so a, a, lo a lo logic for Frege consisted of two kinds of signs. One are, one is a, a meaningless signs or, or a, a variable meaning signs, signs that have no particular meaning in themselves. Okay, except for their syntactic form. And then there's another set of um, signs which you might call syncategorimatics or something like that. What Frege has in mind here is um, 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 signs which stand for relations between um, expressions of thoughts, between thoughts, um, which are definable independent of the contents of the thoughts, but only by virtue of relations between the, their truth values, so, or when they would be true, okay. So we have a small set of things that do that. Okay, so <clears throat> this is where the hand-waving comes in. Let's try that out, okay. Um, let me try the next slide to give you an idea to show you what I had in mind. That doesn't, you can't see it very well. Okay, so, so here's what we're going to imagine. You can imagine it two ways. One way, um, we, want to we want to build a language, right? We're going to be constructive linguists, okay? 
So we give the language a syntax. Um, we um, define some category of syncategorematics in the language, things that relate bits to bits, kind of in the way that Frege's signs with constant meaning do. Right? And now the next step is going to be that we want to do something to those signs which is going to make them meaningful so that the sentences of this language we're trying to construct are actually meaningful sentences. What do we have to... Can you name this free or logical that it should be because it's a big Okay, that's not important because that's where I'm going to do hand waving. Just to read... Oh, what? Oh, are they, well, so we're looking at how extensions of concepts can relate to each other. So two concepts can um, be disjoint, that is, what falls under one doesn't fall under the other, where they can overlap, right? So they can have an intersection, or one can be contained in the other. Right? These are, so you have those kinds of relations. You have a set of, never, never mind about that very much. Oh, is, okay. <laughs> um, um, Okay, so let, another way of looking at what we're trying to do, what I want to do is just, I'm going to do a lot of hand-waving about the mathematics and just talk about the philosophy, okay? So you can look at it two ways. One way, we're building up a language, right? And we've got meaningful symbols for relations like this, okay? And then we've got stuff that um, these relations are supposed to relate, but so far, right, we haven't said anything that gives that stuff any specific content, right? So we've got concepts, but we've done nothing to say what concepts they are. We just say they're some concepts or other. Okay. Um, what can we do to um, <clears throat> um, add to this the fact that these things which don't express any concepts yet actually are going to express some specific concepts? Look at it another way. This might help you think about it more. Um, start out with some large piece of discourse in, in French or English or, or Portuguese or whatever you like. Redact it. Redact everything in the discourse, right? So you strike it out, you make it all black, right? Um, and except for um, some class of syncategorematics that you don't read that redact. So if it says, if, if there's something in the discourse that runs if blah, 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 then blah, 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 you're, you leave the if then, but you cross out all the rest, okay. What would you have to do to um, get back to um, a, a meaningful sentence, right? Um, um, and, and now, in a non-question-begging way, that is, you have to um, do it by not adding anything that already presupposes that it has meaning, right? So without without just adding something meaningful, you want to do other things that's going to make the whole, are going to make the whole thing meaningful. For example, what I had in mind here is, well, if you get a complex, if you get, make the relations between individual bits complex enough, right, then the whole thing is going to end up meaning something. This seems to be something like what Tome had in mind. How could you do that? Um, one word on why that's philosophically interesting, if I have time for that. Um, um, some philosophers, um, and this is also interesting for uh, artificial intelligence, I guess, um, what I'm about to say now. Some philosophers have the idea that, um, as it's sometimes put, the mind must be a syntactic engine. Okay, what does that mean? The mind must be a syntactic engine because the brain must be a syntactic engine, okay? Uh, why, so to say that the brain is a syntactic engine is to say, well, you know, of course, there are inputs that come in through transducers, right, signals of one kind or another, but as far as the internal workings of the brain, um, the internal workings of the brain, you have bits of brain um, interacting with other bits of brain, right? And the interactions should be identifiable as the interactions they are purely in terms of their syntax. They should be syntactically um, recognizable. So the, the interaction should be definable um, without supposing that the participants in them have anything like content, right? Um, so, I mean, the brain must be that kind of machine because, you know, neurons aren't conscious, right? So what kinds of relations can they stand into one another except ones that can just be defined in terms of the kinds of neurons they are, right? How could 
a being whose capacities were due to a syntactic engine in this kind of sense, uh, be a meaning, a, a being with content, a being that could grasp concepts, express thoughts, and so on. How could this be possible? Right? This is a problem, this is a question, which can seem to a philosopher to demand some kind of answer, right? It's something we should be able to discover how it's possible. Okay, and, and the discovery here, this is where the hand-waving comes in, is that, well, you can't, right? There's no way of doing it. That is, so at least when it comes to arithmetic, um, <clears throat> um, Frege was right about Tome. That is, um, well, if, if Tome's system really consists of a lot of meaningless signs, right, then no matter what the rules are for manipulating the signs, um, you're not going to end up with the whole thing having the content of an arithmetic. Okay, that's Frege's point. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not going to discuss that because I'm probably running out of time. So what have we got here? Um, so here's another quote from the stuff that this is something Weismann and Wittgenstein were specifically reading around 1930, say 31. Okay. Um, this is from the second volume of Green Gazette. So. Um, and what I want to say is that here you can see, um, um, okay, so a couple of remarks. You can see um, an inspiration for an idea of a language game. The ins inspiration is not what it looks like, according to me. It's not the fact that um, Frege is talking about chess and chess is a game. That's not the crucial thing here, although, although it's interesting. The crucial thing is that <coughs> it's supposed to be intrinsic to a thought to have applications. Okay, Different thoughts are going to have different applications, and so a thought is distinguishable, and one thought is distinguishable from another by its different applications. Okay, that's the general idea. So if um, an arithmetic consisted of the expression of a whole bunch of thoughts, and those thoughts had applications, well, maybe that is an arithmetic. Okay, so um, the idea of a language game is that a language game is going to be... Um, um, a game in which um, there were going to be um, certain moves, like a move in chess. So the chess gets into the picture. Um, and those moves have applications, okay. Um, the applications are going to be defined by rules, okay. Um, and that whole thing, um, um, the moves and the, and the rules that give them applications, that's going to make the game and now the important thing about a um, language game is that um, um, wait, what was I going to say? I just forgot. <laughs> um, yes, is that it's a this is something Wittgenstein insists on. A language game is an object of comparison. Okay, we're not trying to construct a language, right, where the materials out of which the language is constructed are going to be some set of language games, um, and not uh, um, rather than I don't know assigning um, 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 extensions to concepts or something like that. Um, that's not the point. They're going to be objects of comparison. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> what are we going to get from these objects of comparison? I'm sure I only have a few minutes now, so let me just make two points. Okay. One point is um, Tome and Wittgenstein, sorry, not Tome, Weismann and Wittgenstein <laughs> felt that although Frege was correct in attacking Tome, that there was uh, some kind of deep truth in, um, in um, formalism that, that Frege had missed. Okay. That deep truth can be um, captured this way. 
Suppose we want to construct an arithmetic. Now, this is not Tome arithmetic anymore. We don't care if it's formalist arithmetic. But the point about it is that we do it by <coughs> um, um, listing some set of postulates. This would be more in a, uh, like to say, the piano postulates. So we list some principles that are supposed to hold of whatever is an arithmetic. Okay. Um, and suppose that these principles are such that they could only be satisfied by what we recognized as arithmetic. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but just make that kind of supposition. Now, suppose Frege comes along and he says, okay, I see your principles. Um, and I see that um, they generate w pretty much what we want the truths of arithmetic to be. So far, so good. Now tell me, what is the number three? Okay. Now, um, Wittgenstein's and Weismann's point is, um, um, well, if the principles really do generate the truths of arithmetic, then asking what the number three is is a kind of an idle question. That is, if I tell you what the number three is, I'm not adding really any information to the information you already have. Okay. Um, and this is one thing we're supposed to learn from the idea of a language game. That is, um, if you had a language game that actually did identify a certain phenomenon, like arithmetic, um, you, it would, you wouldn't necessarily have to say what any pieces in the language game named, right? Um, and if you did go on to say what they named, um, you wouldn't really be adding any information, okay? So... Um, that is a point. Um, oh, okay, I wanted to talk about this if I had time, but I probably don't, so maybe we'll come back to that. What I wanted to get to is, um, this is a point that you find in paragraph 10 of the Philosophical Investigations, where Wittgenstein's saying, okay, I've told you the rules of the game, you know how to play the game, now you want to know what certain signs in the game name. Okay. We can do that. We can add that as a requirement on your description of the game. But if we impose, but if you satisfy that requirement, requirement, you're not telling us anything that we didn't know already, just from the rules of the game. Okay. So that's just to tell us that, in fact, in some sense or other, um, thoughts can be identified by their applications. Okay. On the other hand, so that's one, that's one remark I want to make about this. The other remark I want to make about language games is this. Suppose you think, as some interpreters of Wittgenstein have thought, that you can, um, what I'm about to say is what's is the interesting thing for artificial intelligence, I think. So suppose you think that you can do the semantics of a language in terms of language games, okay? Well, um, um, you can't. Okay, that's not what they're supposed to be for. Okay, and a way of seeing um, that you can't is to again look at the case of arithmetic. There's lots of ways of doing this, but I'm trying to save time, so I'm doing it the quickest way. What are the applications of arithmetic? Let's again think of Frege. Um, here's an example of an application. Frege mentions, if you read the quote back there, he's thinking arithmetic has applications in all the sciences. Indeed, it does. It also has applications. Um, <clears throat> suppose um, um, I'm, we'll make it me this time. I'm in my favorite, um, you don't say Garofista, do you? No? Well, Garofera, okay, I'm in my favorite Garofera. I want to stock up on, um, um, on Biakar Salmon, which is my favorite um, um, champagne and at the moment. And, um, and I notice that it's on sale for, I don't know, 30 euros a bottle or something like that. I also know that, um, that um, I've been using my credit card quite a lot lately, and so I'd like, and so I'd like to know um, um, how many bottles of champagne I can buy now um, on my credit card without going over the limit, okay? So, so that's an application of arithmetic. Um, I didn't fill in the details, I have to tell you the input facts, right, how much I have spent, what the limit is, and so on. But then you can calculate, right, how many bottles I can buy, okay? That's an application of arithmetic. Now, um, um, 
it isn't part of the meanings of, arith or of uh, it isn't part of the content of arithmetical truths that they have specific applications like that, right? And one of the reasons why Frege would want to avoid this idea is that he wants to avoid what he's shown to be wrong, namely sort of empiricist theories of arithmetic, like of numbers, like mill, right? That um, the truths, arithmetic are just general truths, is just general true empirical truths, like what happens, okay, okay. So, um, um, now that's interesting. What I'm trying to get out of that point, so I'm going much too fast, but I'll, I'll be finished in a minute now. Um, um, that's interesting because what we want to note here is the kind of loose connection there is between a thought and its applications. That is, on the one hand, you, you have the thought and you have its applications given the way the world is, right? Um, um, and given the way the world is, um, those distinguish it from any other thought. But that isn't part of the content of the thought, right? Um, because um, the same thought might have um, entirely different applications um, and if the world were different, and it would still be exactly the same thought. Okay. I'm, I'm putting something in a simple way, which is really a much deeper... I think I'm going to just say what the deeper way is. So if you want to do AI, right, and you want, on the one hand, um, your... Um, um, whatever it is, your machine, your artificial machine, which is an intelligent machine, stands in a certain way to certain thoughts, and then um, what's going to make that so is that the machine um, comes then to treat the world and however it then does. You're going to have to leave some kind of flexibility so that for any given content, a lot of different applications could go with that content depending on all sorts of other parameters that you might <coughs> not be able to fix in a unique way in advance. So what we want is... Um, out of artificial intelligence, if it's going to be artificial intelligence, right, is something that Descartes insisted on in 1637. Okay, I'm cutting out a lot of stuff here, which is this, that um, to be intelligent, that is to be a rational being, is to be able to step back from any way of doing anything, right, <laughs> any way of attaching applications to any thoughts, right, and reflect on really that, whether that's the right way of doing it or there isn't a better way of doing it, okay. So that's to make a short story out of what's actually a very long one. But um, I, what I'm suggesting then is if you look at the origin of language games and you look at what an application is supposed to be and why an application should be that, which is something I haven't had time to talk about, um, you'll see that what the idea of a language game points to is not some new kind of way of um, doing computations that could be used by some machine, some artificially intelligent machine, but rather to what, it is, what computations aren't going to do or what it um, looks like they um, aren't going to do. And that will be the hard problem of artificial intelligence. Okay, maybe that wasn't clear, but I'll stop there. Obrigado, thank you very much. So this was Charles Travis of the birth of the language games on the second Wittgenstein philosophical investigations. Now uh, we will have uh, Jean-Claude Dumoncel, the Wittgensteinian Turing tale of natural intelligence uh, in the intelligence framework. Thank you very much, Merci I uh, have uh, some pictures. Great thanks to Marianne Bayo and the whole staff of. Sorry. Again, sorry. <laughs> and, and the whole staff of. Uh, of this, this symposium for um, this meeting. I apologize for my English, which is uh, not artificially, but uh, naturally, very naturally eccentric. 
In the common discussions on artificial intelligence, the Turing test is commonly invoked as a touchstone of the question. While the later Wittgenstein, as the champion of ordinary language, may be viewed under the bargain as a better advocate of natural intelligence. In such, in such a situation, we must remember that the Wittgenstein's lectures on the foundations of mathematics in 1939 were attended by Turing. At the start of these lectures, Wittgenstein asked the question, how many numerals have you learned to write down? And Turing answers, quotation, well, if I were not here, I should say, Aleph zero, Aleph zero, the number of natural numbers. Wittgenstein replies, I entirely agree. And he continues as if the Turing's answer were flatly Aleph zero. But the plain Turing's answer was, if I were <laughs> not here, I should say Aleph zero. And this is a joke. So, but in the Wittgenstein's list of language games, it exemplifies the truth, making a joke, telling it. This notwithstanding, the main fact is here that in these Wittgenstein's lectures, the chief partner of Wittgenstein was Turing. So, that the lectures were the main meeting between the leading craftsman of artificial intelligence and the leading defender of naturalness in language as a supposed tool of natural intelligence. And in this meeting, the Turing's answer itself provides a paradigm of the concept which in the philosophy of Wittgenstein, has the main relevance on the philosophy of intelligence, the concept of language games. This suggests that the very idea of a test applied as a criteria of intelligence may be examined at new expense. And in this line of thought, it is striking that the so-called Turing test was, in the terms of its designer, the imitation game. The notion of game is the common denominator of Turing and Wittgenstein. Moreover, the imitation game is also a film, a movie, which on the intelligence predicament makes two points. First, as a qualifying test on intelligence in the whole panoply of games, the one chosen is crossword. Two, by this test, Alan Turing selected Joan Clark. As a language game, crossword has a salient feature. It is a language game which admits among its moves word games or puns, as well as mathematical equations with, between these two extremes, impeccable definitions, even if it is in a metaphorical dress. Such a freedom of ways in crossword will be labelled its methodological freedom. But, but, sorry, but crossword enjoys another freedom, which for our intelligence predicament is of the greater significance 
because it has a conceptual connection with the Wittgensteinian concept of language games, language games included in their corresponding forms of life. In order to exhibit this conceptual connection, the shorter path is opened by, by expanding some examples from Wittgenstein. For example, training is a language game included in the form of life religion. Testing a hypothesis is a language game included in the form of life science. Play acting is a language game included in the form of life theater. Translating from one language into another is a language game included in the form of life traveling rather than resting at home, and so on. That is, the Wittgensteinian concept of language game throws you in a validness of heterogeneous universes. And this is also the violent notion, the violent, violent, sorry, violent motion in thought characteristic of crossword. In the case of crossword, it requires a specific description. A crossword grid has its across and its down, but these abscissa and ordinates are only its Cartesian coordinates or dimensions. And what the affinity with the Wittgensteinian language games discloses is that beyond its Cartesian, Cartesian coordinates, a crossword grid has also an open fan of life dimensions. A good crossword player must be a connoisseur in the history of religions with a knowledge of the difference between transubstantiation, impanation, concomitance, participation and figuration about Eucharistie but also some insights in the difference between surjection and injection as epic and monic arose in categorical mathematics. And each dimension uh, denotes a degree of freedom. Besides the methodological freedom, this is the substantial freedom of crossword. So, that all the above observations converge towards a conclusion, the crossword grid is the playing space of the Wittgensteinian language games, and so the ground of the Wittgensteinian test for natural intelligence. The crossword grid maps the ordinary language the ordinary, ordinary language of language games on the space of natural intelligence. This Wittgensteinian test reaches its simplest expression in the matrix, matrix test as its logic was emphasized by Raymond Ruyère. A matrix test is, for example, uh, the one at the board, blue, sky, um, and red, with uh, an empty square. Here, the empty square acts as a question mark, but the matrix test has also a structural similarity with an open proportions, such as 2 and 3 equals uh, 4 on x, where x is the fourth proportional. Consider the formula 2x equates 12. This solution admits two readings on which Deleuze has grounded his Leibnizian calculus of problems. 
In its logical reading, it is simply a propositional function with its variable x open to quantification. But if you decide that x is the algebraic unknown, then the same formula becomes an algebraic equation setting a problem. And a proportion, a quality of relationships, is two-dimensional, such as a crossword grid. So that the problematic status of the equation is transferred to the crossword puzzle. A crossword grid is something as a multiplied proportion with each of its blanks as uh, with each of its blanks, sorry, to be seen as a kind of X. It is a conglomerate of independent problems condemned to cohabitate. And this intertwining of problems is a Wittgensteinian web. For each blank in the grid, a different language game may be required with its different form of life. A metaphor will be useful here. Probably you have sometimes seen the flying of a bat with its jerky look. The playing of a crossword is a kind of intellectual bat flying. In the Tractatus, Wittgenstein had introduced the concept of logical space, which amounts in his system to the Leibnizian pyramid of all the possible worlds. But the language games have also their logical space. The flying of a bat is restricted to three dimensions, but in the crossword grid, each blank requires the entering in a different dimension with its, which is the, play, the, the playground of a different language game. So, the logical space of natural intelligence is a multidimensional space, and the crossword player is a bat which jerks in a bunch of dimensions. And we must add that, the multifarious characteris that this multifarious characteristic is evolutive. Wittgenstein stipulates that, quotation, a new language games come into existence, end of quotation, with a suggestion. We can yet, uh, we can, uh, sorry, we can get a rough picture of this from the changes in mathematics. This suggestion is of first importance because each language game has its rules. But the changes of mathematics are typically conceptual changes, such as the, admi the admission of imaginaries as numbers. So that the concept of language games embraces the alpha and the omega of our intelligence predicament, it is following rules in a language game and create concepts within new language games. But all this is only the flat achievement in the whole of the Wittgenstein deed on our predicament. As Russell said, there is a Wittgensteinian the first and a Wittgenstein the, the second. Wittgenstein first, Wittgenstein one, and Wittgenstein two. Now, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus takes intel artificial intelligence among its charges as well as the philosophical investigation, investigations discloses natural intelligence. And after all, the setting up of a Tractatus Truth Table is a bona fide language gained 
as well as an exorcism. <coughs> Yet, we are now on a watershed because the philosophical investigations them, themselves divide in two parts. The first part is uh, the language gains fair, but the second part is another story. Here, the point is given at the start, quotation. Grief describes a pattern which recurs with different variations in the weave of our life. Lebensteppisch. If a man's bodily expression of sorrow and of joy alternated, say, with the ticking of a clock, here we should not have the characteristic formation of the pattern of sorrow or of the pattern of joy. And about the Lebensteppich, Wittgenstein stipulates, quotation, what we are interested is in the geometry of the process of sewing to produce such and such a stitch. The process must be so and so. The question is what must the movement of the machine be to produce stitches of a particular kind? End of quotation. As the Turing machine, the Wittgenstein machine is invisible, but its product is visible. It is our Lebensteppich. In order to describe the process of weaving the Lebensteppich, Wittgenstein introduces the idea of a picture face. We have a picture face uh, um, here and uh, under the diagram, and, and the corner of the diagram, and uh, Wittgenstein adds quotation. If you draw these lines, the face becomes sad. At what category belongs this proposition? It is like a geometrical proposition. The physiological is here a symbol of the logical. If in the geometry of the process the physiological is a symbol of the logical, then the Wittgenstein machine produces a new matrix test um, that we, we may uh, complete. On the horizontal arrow, we have the relation becoming sad. On the left vertical arrow, we have the relation symbol of. Um, and the horizont uh, bottom horizontal arrow, we have a relation dual of, the mathematical meaning of dual, duality, uh, dual of. Uh, and on the right vertical arrow, uh, we have the converse of the relation symbol of, or re relation uh, uh, symbolized, or is, or is symbolized. This is the Wittgensteinian diagram of the intelligence predicament. And as a tribute to categorical mathematics, this diagram commutes. The point of this diagram is that the Booleans union and intersection at the bottom behave as solutions in crosswords made as matrix tests. For example, if the matrix test crossword is the one at the bottom of the board, uh, then the solution to be written in the empty space is the Boolean operation inter. 
Now, in Boole's algebra, I'm not saying Boolean algebra in general, but in Bool algebra, 1 and 0 are his respective arithmetizations of being and nothingness. So, that the Wittgensteinian picture face begins to speak. And what he says is to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> Thanks. We will make it happen. I don't know, maybe you have one question for each other. Um, um, <coughs> um, <coughs> I'm not sure I understood. Are you... Uh, okay. What are you proposing an alternative to the Turing test? Or? Oh, I, uh, I think that uh, crossword provides uh, uh, right, uh, but, but the Turing oh, test yeah. provides at the, at the game level uh, a good alternative for the standard uh, standard Turing test. Uh, my 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 my, um, uh, my idea what uh, no, uh, in that, uh, what I uh, what I uh, what I understand as the intelligence predicament. We have um, two alternative strategies, or we may um, have mainly a, a criticism, criticism of artificial intelligence, or we have an apology of natural intelligence. And my, uh, my uh, choice is uh, for the apology of natural intelligence. I, and I think that in, on this, on this, uh, um, on this line of thought, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, with his concept of language game, um, has, has made the main point. And uh, the, pro the problem in, in, this, uh, in this conjecture, sorry. In this conjuncture, uh, sorry, sorry uh, the, uh, the, the, the problem is um, uh, to to obtain for this apology of natural intelligence a kind of equivalent of the, of the Turing test for artificial intelligence. And my, my proposition is that, uh, is that uh, the, the, the structural similarities between language games and the practice of crossword are the the good axis for this, uh, the, uh, for obtain, uh, for, uh, in order to obtain this equivalent. I wonder whether, oh, sorry. I wonder whether um, a problem here isn't, there isn't a problem with the notion of test. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that, uh, so, so let's talk about crosswords. I think a being of whatever kind, natural or unnatural, that had the, the, an unbounded, unbounded capacity to solve crossword puzzles. Um, if it really was an unbounded capacity, right? If it, if it drew on the capacities that we would expect an intelligent being to have, it would be intelligent. Um, if I constructed a test for this, then the question would be, well, is there a way of defeating this test? And maybe there is, uh, I, uh, but um, mm -hmm. so, um, it, so it might be the case that one could pass the test and not be an intelligent <laughs> being. May, may um, I have a translation of the, um, of the objection or question? Um, Can you put it shortly so that I translate it into French? Uh, well, well, I'm trying to make a distinction between the having of a capacity so, so the kinds of capacities, okay, 
the kinds of capacities we expect of intelligent beings have something unbounded about them. They, you can always solve. Can faire une distinction entre les capacités, les capacités d'un être pensant qui sont illimitées. Oui. Et. Um, and the, but uh, then there's the question of whether the having of a ca capacity would should be equated with equivalent to. Um, the passing of some test or other, whatever the test. Posséder la capacité doit être est équivalent à passer le test, comme un test comme le test de Turing. Oui, mais ma réponse, je peux le faire en français. Ma réponse serait peut-être que le la difficulté d'une grille de mots croisés est elle-même peut elle-même varier dans des limites, euh, dans des limites euh, qui sont ouvertes également. Hein. Et par conséquent, euh, il s'agit d'adapter, d'adapter le, le principe général au, au type de difficulté qu'on ait rencontré. Le, le test peut être conçu à des niveaux de difficulté euh, différents. Ce qui m'intéressait, c'était d'obtenir ce qui m'intéressait, c'était d'obtenir un, euh, comment dirais un, un équivalent ludique du test. Je, je pense que si on invoque les, les jeux de langage, il faut, il faut que, le, il faut que le, la, la controverse que constitue cette histoire générale de, de, de intelligence predicament, que la controverse puisse parvenir à un niveau ludique. Et c'est pourquoi, pourquoi j'ai euh, terminé par la construction de cette matrix test imaginaire. Pas Parce que, évidemment, Wittgenstein lui-même n'a pas fait la jonction conceptuelle entre la forme de la bouche dans le sourire ou dans la grimace, d'une part, et les, les opérateurs booléens. Mais mon idée en concluant là-dessus, c'était que qui peut le plus peut le moins, et par conséquent que l'être qui est capable de sourire ou de grimacer de douleur, l'être qui est capable de sourire ou de grimacer de douleur pour, et, et de surcroît de, de, de faire un, un pun ou un joke là-dessus, bien cet être, a fortiori, il dépassera tout ce, qui, tout ce qui pourra être calculable en opérateur booléen avec des zéros et des 1. Voilà. C'est pour ça que je, je concluais sur cette, sur cette proposition de matrix test dans le lignage de Raymond Rouillère et, et de Deleuze également. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Do you want to So I, I would answer that we can that we I would answer that we would adapt the degree of difficulty of the grid to the user. Hmm. So I would answer that it's completely possible to adapt the game to different degree of difficulty and, diffi and degree of depth in relation to its user. But I wanted to overcome the controversy, having a playful approach to it. Um, <laughs> and my answer was to use the matrix uh, of this uh, imaginary um, smile to, in order to express that uh, a being who is able to, to have fun of his own sorrow or yeah, to overcome his own sorrow having fun about himself is some, uh, I mean, joining the bull mathematic with the Wittgenstein uh, game would be someone that is able to it dépassera tout ce qui est calculable. Someone who would overcome all what is possible to calculate. <laughs> uh, are there any questions from the audience? One question from the audience, maybe. Cool. Um. Well, uh, about 
that makes you think that thought is something like connecting images all the time, although it's not clear what an image means. An image exactly. and a proposition. An image and a proposition. I'm not, I mean, it, um, that's not how I want to think about thought at all. Now, what I was suggesting about language games would, in that respect, connect Wittgenstein with Frege in a way that he's not always connected with Frege. Namely, um, for Frege, when you talk about thought, you're making a kind of abstraction. You're not talking about psychological processes in, in anybody. Um, there are, thoughts are things to be thought. They're things that might be either true or false. Okay, then there's another kind of question. You can bring psychology into the picture <laughs> after that and say, I'm not talking about the psychological, the third, the third proposition, the fact that is an image, a logical image, is a thought. And then the fourth is a thought is a proposition with meaning. So thought here is a just a frontier, like in category theory, where a category is, uh, is morphemes, and you have another category with is morphemes, and there is an isomorphism between two categories. So it's not a, a psychological concept. Is really to put two series into connection, and it can be in a computer. Uh, I have to, to, I have a domain where there are faces with smiles, and there is a domain where I have triangles, and I have to make the connection. And intelligence comes there that you are connecting two heterogeneous series into uh, something. That well, I mean, that's one kind of test that somebody could be asked to perform, and um, there are ways in which intelligence can come in there. But if I can say something about, I think one way in which Wittgenstein, according to me, is with Frege, is that um, we shouldn't think of language games as things we actually play. As I said in the talk, language games are objects of comparison, right? So a way of understanding what somebody is doing 
might be to construct a language game and say it's like what you would be doing if you were operating by certain kinds of rules or something like that. But one thing that's um, important for Wittgenstein is that things like thinking and understanding and so on should be looked at in terms of capacities, um, not processes. Um, so um, <clears throat> it isn't like, as I say, I mean, in Wittgenstein you get this idea, it isn't like language games are just things we play all the time. That's the wrong kind of picture of the language game. Thoughts aren't things such that we're constantly going through processes of connecting one thought with another, right? Um, we can say things like somebody thinks such and such, and it's on those grounds that he comes to think such and such, but there's nothing about a process in that. On the other hand, you can construct tasks for us to perform, and it's a, a criterion of, a, of a, uh, an intelligent being in, in sort of Descartes' sense, a rational, a race cogitans, right? It's a criterion for that, that um, um, uh, one has an unbounded capacity to find solutions to problems, right? Um, and somebody who has such an unbounded, unbounded, any being that has such an unbounded capacity is intelligent, that's true. But, but that isn't exactly to propose a test for intelligence, and it isn't to describe um, processes to people. Um, and that's really an important point for a lot of reasons, because one of the big divisions between two kinds of philosophy, and I don't mean continental and Anglo, I mean two kinds of Anglo, <laughs> is that there were people who want to um, impose psychological criteria on having thoughts or on there being two different thoughts, and people who want to resist that. So there's Fragians and Rassilians in that respect. Um, Wittgenstein in his Tractatus period, I think, was a Rossilian, but somewhat. But later on. In, in your opinion, for example, when we are talking about the Tractatus, Fox appears on the third proposition as uh, in the logical English of the Fox, and in the fourth proposition, that uh, Fox is a preposition in meaning. So you have two categories, one English and one proposition. A pipe. Well, what's the difference between an image and a proposition? In the first, you, you say a logical image is a, is a thought. In the fourth, you say a thought is a proposition in meaning. So you are making a connection. Thought is serving as a logical image and as a proposition in meaning. But they are from two different domains because the image of a pipe is not a sentence, this is not a pipe. They are, it's like, they thought is me here the, the work of imagination in kind of, in the intuition, but a pure intuition of geometry. Okay, okay. And, uh, <laughs> Did, were you talking about Cecilia Poison Peep? Yes. Oh, wait, okay. I'm very sorry to interrupt the discussion, but I'm, I'm being told we are running out of time, so. Uh, I want to thank uh, both speakers again. It was very interesting and illuminating. Thank you.